Good morning, uh, everyone, or good afternoon, if you are joining us from uh, different parts of the world. My name is Lara Habib, and I present business news on Al Arabiya News Channel. It's an honor to take part in the conversations in Davos again this year, virtually this time. I'm definitely missing the beautiful Alps, but can't say I don't welcome the warmth of uh, Dubai's weather. Hope you and your loved ones are safe during these unprecedented times. Let me begin by explaining the format of uh, the session. Uh, the first half is live streamed, open to the public. We will then move to a closed, lively discussion limited to the shareholders or to the participants of the forum under Chatham House rules. Uh, you will have the chance to ask the questions throughout both sessions. I will address them in the second half, but you can start sharing them from now through the chat feature on Zoom. For the next hour, we will go through implementing stakeholders' capitalism in MENA, a region that had to deal with the dual shocks of a pandemic and low oil prices, limiting its fiscal capacity to support its slowing economies. Adding to the challenges, one of the highest youth unemployment rate in the world and an ongoing refugee crisis. In that aspect, what role can stakeholders' capitalism play to help the region emerge from this crisis towards a more sustainable, equitable and inclusive growth? Where are the priorities and how can both the private and the public sector coordinate and contribute towards a larger impact on their respective societies? Hoping by the end of this session, we would have a clearer picture on how to take stakeholders' capitalism from principle to practice in the MENA region. I'm looking forward to hearing the ideas of our speakers on this topic and happy to be joined today by His Excellency Abdallah Binto, UAE's Minister of Economy, Mrs. Hanadi Saleh, Chair of the Board of Directors of Kuwaiti-based Agility, one of the leading logistics firms in the world, Khaled Ahmedan, CEO of Bahrain Economic Development Board, and Anas El Faris, uh, President of King Abdelaziz City for Science and Technology, the Center for Innovation and Research in Saudi Arabia. Thank you all for being here. Your Excellency, uh, the UAE was highly agile in its uh, management of the COVID crisis. We have seen a rather quick return to economic activity and a fast rollout of the vaccine. What role did stakeholder capitalism play in your approach and how did you balance between the safety of your citizens versus the costs of lockdowns on the business community? Thank you, Lara. First of all, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here to witness a very strong commitment of the members of World Economic Fund. Although we're meeting very virtually, I believe that this situation doesn't lessen the interest and the enthusiasm of everyone to share the same advanced vision for a more inclusive and sustainable global so socio-economic system. To answer your question, Lara, I want to describe how agility has been a key approach that guided the UAE government practices, particularly the last few years, and it was one of the main pillars that enhanced the country's ability to deal with COVID-19 crisis. And we'll then share with you some of the most important recent initiatives. To start off, mainly the, the March for Agility and Proactive Thinking is under the UAE government long time before COVID-19, with major project pioneers that are the government launched to accelerate the implementation of our national agenda and to boost our future growth. Let me mention four of them. First of all, we had launched a couple of years ago the UAE Ministry of Possibilities. This is the world's first virtual ministry to apply design thinking and experimentation to develop a proactive, disruptive solution to tackle critical issues. It was launched back in April 2019. It represents the next generation of government operation and how we utilize the virtual ministry to activate proactive services that support business continuity during COVID-19. The second one was the UAE Rec Lab. The first regulation lab is also a revolutionary approach in the legislation and the regulation system that the government launched back in January 2019. It designed to proactively, to proactively anticipate and develop future legislation governing the use and application of emerging technologies. With that said, I think one of the major uh, projects was in the Rag Lab was actually distance learning. And this learning was something was one of the most, you know, uh, uh, issues that before COVID-19, uh, most of the education educators were actually against. When COVID-19 came in, distance learning was actually implemented on the spot. This shows you how the UAE was very proactive in actually uh, uh, addressing uh, uh, such issues. 
The third one I would like to mention as well, and shed some light on it, which is the first government accelerator. It's a mechanism where UAE government launched back in October 2016 to rethink how government works by introducing a unique model built on accelerated results, increased collaboration and innovation between stakeholders in the uh, uh, government and in the private sector to actually advance towards delivering projects in, uh, under 100 days. And one last one, which is I would like to mention as well, which is the Dubai Future Accelerator, an initiative by the Dubai Future Foundation that facilitates, collaborates between government entities and private sector in, in tackling down the major sectors of challenges that the, 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 the globe is facing. So during the post and the crisis, well, the post crisis, the UAE Ministry of Economy as well, uh, on the agility aspect, led several initiatives. One of them, which is very important, is the 33 initiative plan. We unveiled this plan back in August 2020 and support key economic sector, which had about three phases to roll out. The first, the last six months as well, uh, uh, we launched a couple of key initiatives, the working on business continuity and supporting the private sector, stimulating trade and investment. Like I said, one most important part as well in the uh, in the UAE and the world, we, we are not expert in pandemic. And I think we as Minister of Economy uh, and my colleagues, uh, when we joined back on the 5th of uh, July, we had no ex experience and expertise in doing so. And we, we joined the ministry in the new cabin three shuffle uh, uh, and we took a step back to understand how can we really unlock uh, issues that can actually uh, help the economy to move forward, especially in the COVID-19. One of them, let me mention a couple of the laws. One of them is actually the commercial company law we, uh, that led to 100% foreign ownership. The other one is the commercial transaction, and this led to the decriminalizations of the checks. The third one was the improvement and the update of the bankruptcy law that took in consideration pandemics and, 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 and enforcement. Due. The third, the fourth one, which is the most important one, which is the consumer protection law. This is securing market stability in crisis times and regulating e-commerce. The movement of uh, uh, diversifying and changing four main uh, 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 laws in, in, the, in, in six months show how the UAE government is very agile and moving forward towards actually unlocking the potential of its economy. We're looking to, as well to reinforce our anti-money laundering system, enhancing measures to support family-owned businesses, the tourism sector, and to support the circular economy. As you heard a couple of days ago in the cabinet, we actually launched the, UAE, the first UAE circular economy in co coordination with the World Economic Forum. And this is something which is now we have in the UAE uh, a, a policy that actually focuses on circular economy, uh, 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 not just for the UAE, but for the region as well. This is very comprehensive, uh, and the work that the, the government plays uh, is very pivotal to accelerate the UAE transition towards a new economy. These efforts from our part is uh, the preparation for our next 50 years. As you know, the UAE is celebrating its 50 years this year, and this is with our line of uh, the celebration of the UAE centennial 2071, where can we effectively utilize the four industrial revolution uh, applications, AI, Internet of Things, big data, and shaping our future and prosperity. I, I will come back to that point, but I, I want to ask you here, th th these are great steps that the UAE has taken. Um, however, we haven't seen um, cash injections or um, in the most hit industries uh, in COVID the, the same way we have seen in other uh, parts of the world, especially in the developed nations. I'm talking about UAE or uh, in general, the region. Uh, we haven't seen cash given uh, or handed to uh, citizens directly, especially the ones that lost their jobs. So why was not this approach, uh, why we haven't seen this approach uh, in the UAE or the region, in your opinion? In my opinion, I think every region and every country has its own policies and ways of actually uh, anticipating the shock of the pandemic. And I think what the UAE have done uh, back in March and April, moving very fast, we have unlocked about $100 billion of uh, uh, fiscal stimulus uh, to, the, to the industry, to the economy, uh, which allowed people to actually use it in ways that actually can benefit the economy, the ways that can keep the jobs still on. Uh, I think that's the most important part. What we're really focusing at the moment is how can the economy of the UAE uh, uh, unlock its potentials moving forward? And I always say the UAE economy is very fit and fit, uh, fit to, go, to, to, to move forward faster as well. Thank you, Your Excellency. Hanadi, I want to hear your opinion here on stakeholders' capitalism. 
Um, I know that the supply chain and logistics sector proved to be an essential pillar in mitigating this uh, crisis. And I know that Agility was in talks with governments and producers of the vaccine to distribute it around the world. And that, that is just one example of the role that the business community can play in stakeholders' capitalism. Do you believe that this crisis changed the perspective of the private sector on stakeholders' capitalism in the MENA region? Hi, Nara. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I want to thank the World Economic Forum for hosting me on this panel. Um, agility has always taken a long-term view with regards to stakeholder capitalism and has, ho has always worked with different government sectors historically, even during COVID and plans to going forward. But with what we're going through right now, with the twin shocks, as you mentioned, with regards to the oil prices and also COVID, is really taking its toll. And from my perspective, both the medium and long-term recovery really calls for, it, for a change and a call to action because it cannot be business as usual. You know, one critical aspect is really diversifying away, diversifying away from the hydrocarbon economy and really tackling unemployment. From our perspective, these structural reforms that the governments are undertaking, while good and strong, is really an opportunity for us to harness, you know, both government and private business collaboration and for us to, ask both, to act both swiftly and fast and collaboratively. You know, from my perspective, it's critical that the private sector is deeply engaged throughout this process, not simply from strategy formation, but also into execution. But it is going to need, need sort of sort of a cultural and mindset shift on both sides. You know, on company boards, you know, we historically looked at profitability as a main metric of success. And moving to a more inclusive approach and addressing the principles of stakeholder capitalism is going to require a mindset shift. And also from the perspective of the government, you know, consulting deeply and executing in a partnership with the private sector is taking place more than before. But that level of engagement needs to be sustained and deepened over time, as we have seen through our experience. You know, the good news is we are seeing the evolution across the region, you know, an ongoing progressive reform. And also the desire to attract more foreign direct investments is going to help accelerate this trend. Now, I'll give you one simple example in Kuwait specifically is through Kadipa the Kuwait Direct Investment and Promotion Authority. It is a government-supported arm, and it works closely with the private sector. And over the past few years, it has contributed around or promoted around one to, one to $3 billion of foreign investment in Kuwait, which is, you know, acted to spur job creation and diversification. But if, there, if you ask me, I mean, you did refer to some of the things that we've been working on, but if you ask me about the agenda, which is really, you know, personal and close to my heart, and I, where I think, you know, private and public cooperation has a huge impact, it's really alongside the SME agenda. You know, empowering SMEs, especially through digital skill sets, is a vehicle for growth and diversification for our long-term future. You know, if you ask me, you know, why focus on SMEs? You know, they're recognized as a you know, driver of future job creation and also an engine of economic diversification. You know, from our perspective, you know, as a private sector, you know, headquartered in Kuwait, and I, you know, I presume also for our region, is that, you know, the public sector can no longer be the job provider first resort, you know, but together we have to tackle a lot of the issues, you know, that SMEs face and are well documented. You know, I'll give you one simple example, access to finance. It is a major issue and closing that gap alone can contribute, you know, close to around 15 million new jobs by 2025 in the Arab region, according to the IMF, uh, according to the IMF. And if you're to ask me, you know, where does private sector play a role? It's really in helping them scale up, you know, through either whether it's venture funding, incubation, training, mentorship, or even plugging them in our supply chain. Together, the private and the public sector can enable sort of an entrepreneurial system for SMEs to thrive in. You know, if I give you a few examples of what we have done over the past, uh, before I conclude my statement, is, is I, can give you, I can give you various elements, you know, number one, uh, Agility is investing in uh, Reem Mall in Abu Dhabi. It's a billion dollar mega mall in Abu Dhabi, which is going to be the region's first sort of smart mall. And it is, you know, one of the cornerstones and ideas for this mall is creating a digital academy. It's going to host an SME incubator. You know, the idea is to incubate 100 SMEs representing 4.0 industries and disciplines. And, it, you know, the goal of it is to create 5,000 plus jobs within the UAE in the space of technology. Another example is our partnership with the Kuwait National Fund 
with the Kuwait National Fund. You know, historically, we've worked very closely with them and provided SMEs with industrial land to support them in their startups. And during COVID, we worked closely with them in supporting SMEs, which were largely decimated because of COVID, and giving them free digital toolkits to move their offline stores online. And other areas over the past is we worked very closely with MIT Labs and the Kuwait Fund for Advancements in Sciences and Data Hackathons, where, where we've trained you know, hundreds of individuals with you know, obviously coding toolkits uh, and tackling real life problems. You know, what I wanna say is you know, this private and public sort of uh, collaboration is not new to us. You know, we've been working on it for years and we're strong believers in it. You know, we believe this is an area which makes sense for business, our economy, and our society. We've taken a long-term view on, on it, and more recently we've qualified for the FTSE for Good Index and the MS, MCSI Index. You know, I think this is an opportunity for us to work swiftly and together for the future of our economy and our society. Thank you, Lara. Um, uh, thank you, Hanad. You mentioned so many interesting uh, points and uh, especially uh, the thing about the digital uh, skills. Uh, PwC in a survey, uh, uh, survey among uh, the region CEOs, 70% said that uh, the availability of key digital uh, skills uh, is a business threat and that shows us the shortage of such skills in the region. Although we have the infrastructure, although we have a tech-savvy population, and high internet uh, penetration. Um, but let me go back to uh, the role of the private sector um, uh, in this uh, crisis, in mitigating uh, this crisis. And I want to ask you here, Khalid, I guess we all agree that uh, the uh, uh, mitigation of the, of the crisis was not possible without the help of the private sector in terms of digital solutions, health services and production and the distribution of the vaccine, to name just a few. Uh, what can you tell us about Bahrain's experience in that matter and how can we build on uh, this public-private collaboration for a better future in the region? Uh, thank you, Lara. Thank you to the World Economic Forum. Uh, one thing that Bahrain we've been doing for many years and we want to continue doing, and uh, the sense of urgency is higher now because of COVID, is the digital transformation. It is the world of fintech. And what we see is the adoption, uh, the adoption of digital, uh, digital solutions. Today, we take a close look at two factors, which is number one, how many people have opened an account with a pure digital bank? And the second thing is how many people are using e-payment solutions? The adoption rate because of COVID has accelerated threefold. The number of accounts that were expected to open in 2020 before we knew COVID was going to happen versus what actually ended up happening was threefold increase. We knew there was going to be an adoption, but not at this rate. And the second thing is in terms of e-payments. E-payments is critical. And we see the volume before COVID and we see the volume at the end of last year. And it's a threefold increase. And this is important. This is important. We laid the groundwork many years ago, and now it, would, it enabled us to cope and mitigate the effects of COVID. What we see happening, one thing, it's very difficult to isolate which subsector in fintech is going to do well, which subsector is going to do bad. But one thing is clear is COVID is probably spelling the death of cash. The government of Bahrain today no longer accepts cash as a payment method. We do not accept cash. Only electronic payments. And that's important. This is going to add transparency to the system. The government is taking the lead. We expect the private sector to follow and we will transition from a traditional economy to a cashless society and a cashless economy. With that, there's going to be a lot of data. That data is going to be stored. It's going to be analyzed. And with that analysis, the government will be able to target its policies and regulations to the people and the segments of society that need it the most. And businesses will be able to take that data, analyze it, and provide products and services that are very useful to the consumers. Thank you, Lara. Are we heading to a nationalization of the data? Uh, it's now the treasure, and uh, uh, keeping it uh, private is very important. So what is Bahrain doing in that aspect? In, in terms of data, Bahrain is very clear. We were one of the people that had the first hyper data center in the Middle East. In order to do that, we understood that data has to be protected. 
and people who, if we want people to store their data in Bahrain, they need to feel that they are in control of it. Part of what we did was we passed the data jurisdiction law, which is the first in, in the world, first of its kind, which is if an American company was to store data in Bahrain, that data is American. No, but no other authority has access to that data except the Americans. And it's data embassy law. That's useful. It is going to be difficult in a world where there is digital world. Data is important. Who has access to that data is important. And if everybody starts to say that this is my data and I'm going to nationalize it, it's going to be very, very difficult to live in a global world. And not only is it going to be difficult, it is, it's going to inhibit us from able to scale up. Many of the solutions that we're able to do today are that become cost effective because they're being deployed in multiple countries. If every country is going to be so protective over its data and what is available here, we're unlikely to have a platform and a solution deployed in each country. In order to scale up, there needs to be cooperation between government to governments. I want to hear uh, your thoughts, uh, Mr. Anas, uh, because um, I know that Saudi Arabia um, is uh, recently opening uh, local data centers with international companies. Yes, first, uh, I'd like to thank the World Economic Forum for uh, the, the kind invitation uh, to participate in this uh, session with the, with the extraordinary panelists. And, uh, and uh, thank you as well, Lara, for the question. Yes, uh, Saudi Arabia is, is uh, heavily looking at, at um, uh, working with many data centers, uh, whether uh, and, and bringing in uh, multiple companies that work in, in the sphere of, uh, of uh, uh, data. Uh, data Data is no doubt the fuel of, of the new economies, and, and we believe it's, it's very critical to, to make sure uh, we, we include uh, a great deal of, of that as well. Thank you. Um, I would like to move now to Your Excellency, and um, um, in, if we want to continue the conversation on digitization, uh, one thing that we have seen in this crisis is the um, acceleration of the digitization trend, which was already in motion in the region. Um, though enabling uh, the digital transformation has been a pillar of uh, national reform plans in the region, uh, COVID amplified the urgency to adopt it. Uh, where are the priorities of the UAE in that matter? Uh, what can you share with us the successful digital models that were implemented recently? And how did you make use of the fourth industrial uh, revolution center that was created in collaboration with the WEF? <clears throat> Thank you, La. I think uh, what we believe is in the government is the integrated role between government and private sector in achieving this growth. The next couple of years will be uh, at the heart of our principle, especially in the stakeholder capitalism, and especially what we're doing with the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution that we're engaging with WEF and the key partners in the region. These principles are not in our values and beliefs in the UAE. Uh, uh, these are historically, the UAE has always promoted a balanced approach to development with key consideration to support the role of both private sector and development model. So the private sector investment in the UAE have played a major role in this establishment, especially in the modern economy, with generating jobs and growth of human resources, promoting transfer of knowledge, expertise, and technology. Therefore, what we have seen in the COVID-19 very recently and very respectively, countries had repercussions. Uh, pandemic in all of our life, our humanity uh, uh, has never been more tested than now, and this is the right time to show that we can rebuild our lives stronger and more resilient with the ideas formed with the Fourth Industrial Revolution, especially the center. There are three areas that we already started working and developing uh, with the World Economic uh, Forum team uh, to be launched later on this year, and these include the crafting an inclusive economic policy of a new social contract, uh, stimulating an economic integration and lasting harnessing the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The main initiative that we are working on to become more vibrant hub for the cutting innovation R&D is more on the digital asset services. Approach towards investment. We also look to measure under the umbrella of the Security and the Commodities Authority that I chair to allow of the issuance of digital assets, crypto assets, and tokenization of financial instruments and commodity, and the regulation of the licensing of financial activity related to crypto assets, namely exchanges, crowdfunding platforms, and other financial uh, activities. 
In addition, these are industries that will be impacted most by tokenization are some of the major drivers behind the UAE social and economic development, such as financial services, real estate, public sector, venture capital, commodities, and startups. And with the fourth industrial revolution center in the UAE, we will focus on practical trials of this technology this year in the tokenization project. We will explore the tokenizations of SMEs, venture capital funds, and real estate, as well as we are supporting the ethical development of AI-powered education tools. The center is a part of the larger mission to be a leader in the fourth industrial revolution globally, established back in January 2019 in Davos, and as a collaboration between the Dubai Future Foundation and the World Economic Forum, the center develops technology which govern across three focus areas, AI, blockchain, and precision medicine. It's worth to mention as well that the fourth IR has generally been driven by the public sector in the UAE. For example, 2014, we, 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 we launched the National Innovation Strategy. 2016, we had the block, Dubai Blockchain Strategy, Radio Forensic Strategy in 2017, the UAE Fourth Industrial Revolution Strategy in 2018, the Federal Blockchain Strategy in 2019, and the National AI Strategy as well in that year. So you can see that the UAE is, is proactively working towards that, especially working with the center, and what we're doing at the moment is experimenting both in the, in, the, in the UAE as well with uh, both public and private sector. Um, Anas, can I have your thoughts here? Because I know Saudi Arabia has also a fourth industrial revolution center. Uh, um, Saudi Arabia uh, recently announced uh, um, the uh, digital economic policy uh, to encourage investments in innovation and digital uh, transformation. And we have seen also the open uh, banking uh, policy that can help fintech. In what fields do you think the kingdom will compete and what governance measures should uh, be in place uh, to balance between the efficiency and data privacy to ensure the protection of different uh, stakeholders. Uh, sure. Um, so, um, uh, let me before you before I answer the the question, uh, Laura. I might. I think it would be important to just first draw attention uh, to the technology and innovation context uh, that's currently uh, enabling uh, the fourth industrial revolution in the in the kingdom. Um, there is no secret that we we have uh, ambitions to be a tech hub in the region and and beyond. Uh, the Vision uh, 2030 uh, deployed um, many um, uh, 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 national vision realization programs with uh, defined objectives uh, that include uh, unlocking uh, potential uh, of of non oil uh, sectors, uh, growing and diversifying the economy, as well as nurturing and supporting mm -hmm. innovation and entrepreneurship culture. Uh, in fact, uh, the National Industrial Development and Logistics uh, Vision Realization Programs currently aims to uh, transform uh, the kingdom into a leading industrial uh, and international logistics uh, platform in, in several promising areas uh, that were uh, defined uh, uh, in, in, the, in the strategy, as well as, as the Industry 4.0 as a key enabler uh, for the industrial uh, sector. Um, recently, uh, the Crown Prince uh, announced the new five-year uh, PIF strategy that will focus on uh, localizing uh, cutting-edge technologies and, and, uh, and knowledge um, with uh, the very strong uh, objective of partnering with innovative and transformative and disruptive companies around the world uh, with, with, of course, uh, the goal of serving as an important um, uh, catalyst for the development of industries and opportunities in, in the future. Um, we today are, are seeing progress on, on the ground. Uh, uh, in, in the case of the PIF, the assets under management currently reached more than uh, four billion U.S. dollars, uh, and with with the aim of increasing that to over uh, one uh, trillion U.S. dollars by 2025. Um, we also uh, are seeing a living example in Neom, which is becoming a living laboratory and a hub um, for innovation and a model for new future uh, cities. Um, in fact, uh, even in, in the digital infrastructure, the, the kingdom has been uh, uh, investing heavily. It deployed its uh, ICT strategy uh, 2023, which was launched back in uh, 2018, uh, to transform the kingdom into digit, uh, a digital and uh, a powerhouse. Um, uh, it, uh, the kingdom also established uh, recently the uh, Saudi Data and AI Authority, uh, Sadaya, to position, to position the kingdom as a global leader 
sector in uh, in data driven economies um, uh, it also announced uh, its strategy for data and artificial intelligence in in which it uh, indicated that the country will be investing uh, over 20 billion uh, in ai pro projects by 2030 Again, uh, uh, as a result, uh, we see that Saudi Arabia now ranks first among G20 countries uh, in the Digital Rise Up report, uh, which analyzes ranks uh, and changes that countries around the globe uh, have seen in their digital competitiveness uh, over the last uh, uh, three years. Uh, it's currently also ranked uh, fourth globally in terms of um, uh, 5G technology and tenth in terms of internet speed, according to uh, the um, Ministry of, of Communication and Technology. Um, mm -hmm. In its innovation system, uh, we are today, uh, we've been investing heavily in our NIS uh, national innovation system by, by developing uh, several programs and initiatives that support innovation and R&D. Um, as a result, currently we're ranked first among Arab nations in regards to number of publications. Uh, we're also ranked first uh, according to the H index, which measures quality of research output, as well as first among uh, uh, Arab nations in granted patents per, uh, per capita. Uh, this hopefully, we hope, would lay the ground uh, to an exceptional trajectory of, of innovation in, in the kingdom. Uh, like uh, His Excellency Dog, we, we also have been um, uh, interested and, and deployed our um, C4IR center in, in, in the kingdom uh, mm -hmm. with, with the objective of, of again supporting uh, this transition uh, we're looking at. Um, the WEF uh, affiliate center uh, was introduced after a meeting uh, between His Royal Highness the Prince Mohammed bin Salman and, and the WEF's Borgay uh, Brende. Um, we are uh, uh, looking at it as a vehicle to support the future of uh, for IR in the kingdom through working with stakeholders to uh, co-create, co-design, and uh, pilot new approaches uh, to technology adoption. Uh, we've been uh, looking at uh, multiple uh, projects under multiple dimensions, um, whether it's in AI and ML, IoT, robotics, drones, and autonomous vehicles, blockchain, uh, smart cities, or in agile government uh, governance. Um, and we've started deploying several uh, projects. Uh, uh, they include the Smart Corridor uh, project, which is about autonomous trucks and autonomous truck platoons, which we're engaging now with the Ministry of, of Transportation in the Kingdom uh, to develop policy and regulatory frameworks uh, for connected autonomous vehicles. Uh, we're also looking at heavy lift drones and development of policy development for with the Saudi General Authority of Civil Aviation and Aramco uh, to develop and enable regulations that can serve as a test case uh, for um, heavy lift drones for delivery. Uh, we're also working with the Ministry of Environment, uh, Water and Agriculture on uh, precision agriculture to develop uh, frameworks to allow drones and AI for for image processing, navigation to be used for um, agricultural applications, including spraying uh, pesticides, uh, monitoring uh, crops, uh, uh, growing health, and, and, and beyond. Uh, impressive uh, plans indeed.